Hello everyone, welcome to the European Society of Cardiology Congress 2022 here in Barcelona. My name is Vijay Konodian. I'm Professor of Interventional Cardiology based in Newcastle upon Tyne, United Kingdom. I'm delighted to be joined by Professor Tom Lusher uh, from Royal Brompton Hospital and who is also our President-elect of the European Society of Cardiology. Welcome Tom. We have a very hard task ahead to discuss. We are going to be discussing the future of medicine and cardiology. So it's really amazing to be back in person at the Congress, but we have missed the last two years. Even before the pandemic began, cardiovascular disease was the number one cause of mortality, not only in Europe, but worldwide. But of course, the pandemic has caused so much disruption to the way um, we handle heart disease, and it's still a major, major problem. So how are we going to handle it in the days ahead? Well, we just published a paper uh, with uh, Chris Gale on the collateral damage of uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, in patients with heart disease. And of course, they, they are prone to have complications because the virus induces inflammation in your uh, body. And so in the future, we have to be more prepared for the uh, number of patients that we face in such a pandemic. Uh, unfortunately, we were not prepared at that time. Yes. And uh, that caused a lot of uh, increased mortality, particularly in patients with STEMI, uh, but also with heart failure. So that, that is certainly uh, one aspect, but uh, hopefully with uh, further vaccination, we can uh, prevent most of it in the future. Yes. So, of course, um, there are so many aspects to cardiovascular care, isn't there? Of course, we come up, we've got so many late-breaking clinical trials demonstrating new therapy in, in intervention where I practice interventional techniques. But that's not universally available to everyone. There is so much disparity. Again, the COVID pandemic has highlighted that. And we know that patients belonging to the low socioeconomic status have high burden of cardiovascular disease and mortality. So in addition to providing all of these therapy, there is so much more that needs to be done. So what do you think that we from the ESC can contribute to that moving ahead and bring down cardiovascular disease as the leading cause of mortality wo worldwide? Well, first of all, we have to implement better what we have. And this is not just in countries with, with, with a lower economic uh, situation, but also in rich countries. Uh, any uh, of these uh, uh, cohort studies shows that, for instance, patients after PCI are not properly treated. They don't reach the uh, uh, recommended uh, uh, targets for LDL cholesterol. Yes. Blood pressure is the same, although there has been improvement and of course, uh, diabetes, which is a, yeah. a pandemic as well, yes. is another aspect of it. So the, the ESC, through the guidelines, uh, yeah. provided new targets and, try, and we have to try to educate physicians to understand Absolutely. that we need to go to more lower targets, both for blood pressure, for uh, um, uh, lipids and in diabetes we have to really use properly the drugs that for the first time yeah. change outcome and of course there's a lot of unmet medical need obesity is a yes. problem to treat yeah. for instance to get rid of smoking is also yeah. not easy and this is and then of course there's specific diseases where we uh, are far from curing we're just treating and in some instances we're even palliative in our measures so we need in implementation yeah. and innovation. Yeah. And I think the ESC is well placed for that yeah. uh, uh, by the providing guidelines on what to do with what we have, but also provide the forum as we have it here yes. for innovation. Yeah. And also public awareness. Even to this very day, people think, or particularly in women, they think, cancer is the, is the leading cause of their problem and mortality and heart disease doesn't really come up as their number one thing and a lot of symptoms being ignored and patients present very late so and I still believe that there needs to be so much um, awareness even among the public. Yes and the physicians you know we are we're just uh, publishing a paper in the Lancet with more than 400,000 non-STEMIs 
showing that, uh, for instance, the gray score that is commonly yeah. used mm -hmm. that is not very precise yeah, in women. Absolutely, yeah. And also, I was a bit shocked that uh, women present later. Yeah. Uh, and when they leave, uh, they get less angio uh, angiography and yeah. PCI. And uh, also when they leave the hospital, they get less statins, which yeah. is completely weird. Yeah. Uh, so I think uh, this is certainly a, a patient group that we need more awareness for. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and but also ethnicity is a is a big issue, uh, yes. particularly in the United Kingdom, but also other uh, uh, countries where there is. Uh, you know, a lot of uh, variety of, uh, of people with uh, uh, different backgrounds. And we know, for instance, that uh, people from India or originating from India have much more diabetes. We have yes. to really look for that and yeah. treat it appropriately with what we have. And, um, and so uh, I think we have to be more personalized in our Absolutely. approach, yeah. both for sex, but ethnicity, and then eventually also genetics when we have more information yes. on what the uh, you know the genetic background of a person is and what it would mean for treatment yeah uh, absolutely and we've touched up upon women how we've been talking about women and heart disease for a very long time that in women heart disease is underdiagnosed under recognized and under treated and hopefully, I was involved with this uh, Lancet Commission to reduce the global burden of heart disease in women by 2030. That's a very ambitious target. Uh, but at least we've now started talking about it and raising awareness. And as you quite rightly said, clinicians, you know, when a woman, for example, presents, they think, I've had patients where they've come and they said, oh, I went to the doctor and they told me it was indigestion and I was sent home. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then the pain continues on five oh, yeah. days later they can't cope anymore, call the ambulance, gross ST elevation all over, and they come to the cat lab, blocked LAD. So it's kind of changing the mindset of the, not only the patients, but as well as the, uh, the care providers. Think heart first. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in, um, May, you know, it will make medicine also more interesting. For instance, as, as you mentioned, in, in, um, in coronary disease, women differ a little bit. They have more non stemies Yes. Than, uh, than uh, males. They have more erosion than plaque rupture. Yeah. Uh, and also in heart failure, they have more half pef rather than half ref. Yeah. So uh, it is quite interesting that, uh, that we have such a variety of presentations among the sexes. And, yes. uh, and so I think in the future, this personalized approach will be much more uh, important. For instance, in uh, patients with uh, heart failure, uh, I'm sure that genetics, particularly non-ischemic mm. cardiomyopathies, will uh, guide us much more, much better to decide on the treatment, maybe on the devices, on the risk of sudden cardiac death, yeah. and so forth. And uh, this will make medicine more interesting and maybe also more effective and more cost-effective. Yes. Yeah. And uh, talking about women, the other when I was a trainee, I didn't see a 90-year-old in the cat lab, but that is a norm because we are living in an era of where people are living longer. Living longer means they have additional comorbidities. So when it comes to, as you quite rightly said, we can't give the same therapy to someone who is 90 or in their 80s with multiple comorbidities, antiplatelet therapy, for example, because it's associated with higher risk of bleeding, etc. So, and again, that, you know, people living longer and comorbidities is also, in my view, adding to the global burden of heart disease that we have, and we really need to tailor the therapy as you, as you mentioned. So when we talk about the future, I would say that the aging process as such is gonna be a future target. We yeah. know that uh, from experimental work that I'm also involved in, that aging and longevity genes produce uh, proteins that markedly affect not only your lifespan but also uh, f foster the development of uh, chronic diseases we suffer from. Yes. So, uh, in experimental situations, in when you you know knock out an aging gene like p66, the animals are not only living longer, they're healthier, they're more resistant to diabetes, they yeah. don't get presbyacusis and other age-related degenerative uh, uh, problems. 
So I think this is going to be a frontier in the future as well. Yeah, mm. absolutely. So we have plenty of work to do. Yes. There is the, the amount of work and the, particularly I am constantly burdened by the amount of disease that we see in our population. So I think we can go on for a very long time to discuss this because it's a massive topic. But I think we've covered uh, some of the important aspect that we could, um, we need to target and we need to address in order to address the mission of the European Society of Cardiology, which is to reduce the global burden of heart disease Indeed. worldwide. Indeed. So Tom, thank you so much. My pleasure. It's an absolute pleasure talking to you. And I wish you an amazing Congress. Thank you, likewise. Thank you very much.